and you you get into these spots i you know i don't remember the hand super well this is a couple years ago now but i just remember distinctly being in spots where it's like okay i know he's too aggressive and i know he's too sticky but can i really adjust as far as i'm about to try and adjust like should i really be for that call <laughs> What's up, everybody? Today we've got one of Run It Once's elite coaches, one of the best poker players in the world, one of the top heads up, no limit heads up players in the world. He's taken on Doug Polk for his $100,000 challenge, coming straight down to allow to take his ass down. Here's Kevin Rabichow. Is that how you say your name? Yes. Yeah. All I right. Thank at God. The exact right time. Well done. <laughs> All right. Sweet. Yeah. So tell us a bit about it yourself, Kevin. I believe you started off playing heads up poker. Is that right? Pretty much. Yeah. I I started playing, like, well, I guess I started playing poker online in 2007, but uh, picked up heads up no limit within the first two years or so. So it was pretty much the game that I, you know, learned the game seriously uh playing i played that for about a decade uh okay i uh i guess for at, at least at some point i know you battled uh quite a bit of heads up or at least i mean i don't know i didn't know much about your earlier history um do you want to yeah why don't you go on about that uh or would you like to talk more about the heads up battles i know we played heads up relatively i mean somewhat recently i guess in 2018 or something like that hmm, i didn't or, realize it was that recently yeah i mean i I think heads like it's probably best to focus on the heads up. the The games that I played before that were I would categorize as like recreational poker. You know, like I was in university and wasn't really playing for income or or trying to play for income by any stretch. And uh, I mean, I mean, around Black Friday was actually the time that I like graduated and and decided to start playing full time. So 2011 would have been like the real beginning of my of my poker career uh and i played heads up no limit exclusively from them in, until 2017 or so so uh, it's like a pretty solid six year stretch of only playing that format and then kind of dabbled in six max online and started playing mtts at some point and you know now we're now we're more of a live tournament player in the last three or four years uh, okay okay cool what was it that uh, ended up and may you decide to take on the all the heads up specialists at high stakes. So that's what I remember happening. I mean, uh, and then finally Doug Poker as Doug, Doug Polk as of recently. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. tell us a bit about your ascent. Yeah, I. I mean, I played. I want to say like one limit below the very biggest games for the majority of my career. Like I was around the time that I was moving up, let's say from like, you know, small stakes to 25, 50, 50, 100 games, like those were the biggest games in the stars lobby at the time that I was playing like just heads up format. Whereas at the same time, guys that wanted to play a little bit bigger were like playing on six max tables, playing like 100, 200 or 200, 400. And it was not exactly like my place in the ecosystem. So I played a lot of the guys who sort of stuck to the heads up lane. Um, a lot of the like Swedish players that you probably came across, or I guess some of the more recent players um, who still play now, like like Button Clicker or or Felizmes or whatnot. Like these guys are still um, pretty serious heads up battlers, mm -hmm. and and they were just kind of making their way up as the time at the time that I was like not losing interest in heads up, but just sort of finding myself, you know, trying out other formats. Um, but like in the last, let's say three or four years, like when opportunities to play big heads up has come my way, I've, I've definitely tried to take it. Um, run it once ran like the legend showdown on their, uh, on their now defunct poker site. And it was, uh, it was an opportunity to play against like, you know, Michael Thuritz and, um, I guess Felizmes was also in that and like, you know, some people from outside heads up like Fedor um, came into that. So that was just like a fun opportunity. And, and I, I took playing Doug kind of the same way. 
I mean, I don't, I don't study heads up every day. I don't, I don't play it all that often anymore, but like, because it's the format that I enjoy the most when an opportunity now comes up to, to play or to spectate or coach or whatever, like I, I try to jump on those opportunities. Oh, okay. So what did you think of Doug Polk? Do you think uh, you had an edge? Do you want to say? I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, also I against the, the other players as well. Do you want to talk about that or no? I mean, let's, I guess let's talk about Doug because it's in recent memory. Like the, go, my expectation going in was that I was going to have a small edge. Um, I think that's probably still true based on my experience playing the match. But like, you know, what are we really talking about? We're talking about 400 hands per day of, of uh, you know, a pretty swingy format where we're trying to push pretty small edges there were like there were no huge opportunities there um and i also for the same reason like it didn't make sense for me to put in crazy amounts of preparation to try and make my edge that much larger and i'm assuming doug would have treated it the same way although i haven't spoken to him about you know how in depth his preparation is i just assume that like when you're running businesses and you're doing youtube content and stuff you're not you're not spending six hours a day preparing. So I'm pretty sure, uh, pretty sure we both just kind of, you know, did the minimum amount of work and then showed up and tried to compete. And I felt like, I, I did feel like the edge I was expecting to be there was there. It was just maybe not in all the exact places that I expected it. Oh, oh really? Okay. So I guess he's got some kind of leaks or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, what about uh, what about Fedor and uh, Mikhail Thuritz and uh, and these other guys, Falimzis or whoever you're talking yeah. about? You know, yeah, yeah. Huh? those were really fun. I mean, those those matches. I was I was still playing a fair bit of heads up then because there were like you know there were some app games to play and there were some things that that had my attention kind of part time while I was doing other things and the the chance to play those matches was really fun because like four or f four of the players who entered probably like almost never play that format. Um, so it was, it was just like, uh, it was very reminiscent of playing heads up a long time ago where you got just a totally different type of match every single time. Like I played five or six, forget how many rounds we played before doing like semifinals and finals, but five or six different matches that all felt extremely different um played a little against bjorn lee who like used to play a ton of heads up as well so he was he was quite tough in that format but like very reminiscent of someone playing 10 years ago and then i played um uh make boyfriend um who, who like it's a high stakes six max player uh marcus uh, last name is is escaping me right now marcus l uh, but he's played like a ton of the biggest six max games online and, and was also playing head like, but was just kind of getting into heads up at that time. So I felt like his style was like, he was super tough, but totally different, uh, in his approach and had all of kind of the typical, like things you would do as a six max player that maybe don't translate all that well to heads up. Uh, and I'm pretty sure he was playing like 10 X the stakes on GG at the same time that he was playing the, <laughs> the heads up challenge. So it was, Who it was this? a fun dynamic because of that as well. Who is this? This is a uh, make boyfriend. Um, I don't know. Who Mar says. Marcus with two K's. If, I don't know if that, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I, I just don't know. Um, I, I understand Fedor and, uh, especially uh, Fedor, especially Fedor and Mikhail to be uh, kind of like modern day feel ish players. Yeah. Uh, they don't really run too many Sims or at least it's not the yeah. basis of their play. I don't know about flimsies. I thought he was like a bit in that category too, but not as much. So, so you're probably going to get some spicy matches. Yeah. Uh, I will say against like these kinds of like guys, it's their, uh, I don't know. I call it like, something like genius syndrome of they're like too they, they're so confident in their own like abilities and they like will do a bunch of things that aren't aren't too good sure um yeah and but have enough ability where like it there's a, a legit battle going on yeah um 
I personally hated losing to these guys. It's <laughs> like, you know what? I, I'm just not buying this whole, like, oh, like, special ability bullshit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Against, like, the theory and, like, actually doing something. But, um, and I don't know. They're definitely very good poker players. Uh, did you, what was your experience playing against these guys? Well, yeah, I mean, it's fu it's funny you mentioned, like, the feeling of losing to someone like that because Fedor was my... I think I think that was the only match that I lost big in was when I played him. And he was, like, so far out there in terms of the basics. Like, the, you know, he never plays the format, so his fundamentals for just, like, preflop decisions and, you know, ra like, ranges to get to certain turns were really, really far off. But he was just playing this like wildly aggressive and sticky style. That's just super annoying when, when he makes the best hand. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so I, most annoying. I definitely, and you, you get into these spots. I, you know, I don't remember the hand super well. This is a couple of years ago now, but I just remember distinctly being in spots where it's like, okay, I know he's too aggressive and I know he's too sticky, but can I really, adjust as far as I'm about to try and adjust like should I really be four bet calling <laughs> you know like you think about four bet calling like ace jack offsuit or something pre-flop and then it's just like <laughs> is that really the correct play and then you find out that he has like you know jack seven off or something and it's like oh maybe I should have like that that probably would have been good <laughs> um and it, it reminds yeah, it me of the, the stand-up game a little bit where it's like now maybe you should start four betting four betting like not so great hands because wildly plus EV <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so that that was how it uh, every decision felt like I was trying to intuit just how crazy he was like it. It's almost detrimental to understand theory in that kind of match, because in the back of my mind is like, OK, well, I know exactly where the line is <laughs> and I know exactly how far away from the line I'm about to deviate. <laughs> and I can, and, and in the moment I'm feeling like, oh, this is so ridiculous. Like, it's just too ridiculous. I can't do that. And then you see the showdown and it's like, oh, I definitely could have done that. Like it's <laughs> <laughs> it for sure would have been the best player. Right. So it would almost be better to be a pure field player against, against that opponent. Oh, um, and then, uh, then I'll like, you know, I'll give you a little, maybe if he's feeling extra cocky, I don't know if it's really in his persona, but, uh, it could be like, oh yeah, I got you. <laughs> I kind of feel like too. Maybe, yeah. 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 It's one of those situations where you like feel really stupid when you didn't do like the extreme thing that yeah. you're not really supposed to do, and it would have been actually smart. And <laughs> those are the most annoying. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, I mean, that so that was that was playing him, who like you know obviously is a very a very strong poker player in other formats, but just had very little experience there. And then like like playing against um, against Thuritz was quite different, though. I felt because he's. I mean, I, I don't know him super well. I guess you would know him better, but like my understanding is that he's kind of this all around like half specialist who's played like quite a lot of volume at a, at a ton of different formats at super high stakes. And as a result, like all of his ideas made sense, like everything he was doing in Heads Up No Limit made sense. And, and he was a lot more accurate than I expected him to be, but but just fully exploitative in in nature like every i don't know I, I yeah i remember hands that you just see showdowns where it's like oh you're just supposed to pure fold that on the flop and and you know that but you just decided that this was a time you know this was a scenario that you were going to run a bluff and it was just going to work um so that <laughs> kind of that kind of fearlessness i guess in in spite of probably understanding like how ridiculous some of those plays are uh, he, yeah, I guess you could say, no, that's a pretty good way of describing him. I don't think he was ever really a no limit specialist or really caught up to the theory of the game. Um, he should have like a number of like moderate leaks according to GTO or whatever. Uh, but he's going to be pretty tough to play against. I mean, maybe Fedor too, but I don't know what he plays like heads up. Um, I mean, Fedor would be a bit more annoying ring to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, Mikhail's ring game is okay. I think, like he he definitely gets he gets it wildly off on some spots, as well. I mean, a lot of his exploits are really maybe it takes him. It feels like it takes him a minute to like adjust to the specific player a lot, but he adjusts pretty well to the overall um, population. And he actually does adjust to a specific player. I guess you could say, 
eventually. I mean, he, he makes some adjustments that uh, most players never make from my experience. And then mm-hmm. he was like really slow in like these ones that he was, he was fast in the ones that, or he, he eventually made the ones that people didn't make. And he was like slow in the ones that people usually make is the funny thing that I found with him. Um, he just thinks different. Yeah, I guess so. He definitely thinks different. Um, oh yeah. I wanted to ask what this uh, crazy hand was against Doug Polk with the five bet bluff. Was it? Yeah. With, uh, two, with what? I guess this must've been, you know, a hundred thousand uh, dollar, a hundred thousand dollar hand or two hundred thousand dollar hand, 250 big blinds with, uh, yeah. There was some ace jack in there somewhere. I don't know what you had. Yeah, I can, I can give you like the quick, the quick hand history, and then, and then maybe we can talk a little more about about what gets me there. But, um, pretty much we, yeah, we're playing like just over two hundred and fifty big blinds deep, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm in the big blind. Uh, Doug opens. I three bet king four of clubs. I think king four suited <laughs> for sure. Uh, he four bets, and I five bet non all in. Like I five, I five bet small. Um, so I think I think the dollar amounts would have been approximately like a four bet to eleven k and a five bet to twenty five k or twenty six k or something like that. Playing yeah. playing like a hundred, maybe a hundred and ten k effective. I you know, all right. I like it. Big blinds. I like it. So he calls. Um, and then it comes nine eight six rainbow, with like yeah. not, with none of my suit if I remember correctly. Uh, check check. Turn ace. Oh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Check check again. Uh, and then river pairs the board. I want to say it was the eight, although it might have been the nine. Um, but river pairs the board, and I go all in for, like seventy eight k or eighty k, something like that. Um, so he does, he does call with ace jack suited, uh, which is, uh, you know, yeah, I would think, uh, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. I would think you could get away with betting the turn. You mean, yeah. you block the few ace king hands he can have. I mean, he might like cry, yeah. call, cry fold or an ace by the river. I mean, who shows a bluff in this spot, right? I mean, it's more likely. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of situation it seems like your play is really reasonable i was expecting something a little spicier for some reason <laughs> i mean i mean the seems like an easy play, call from them. yeah i think i think to someone who's like played a fair bit of this format just kind of understands like okay well you're at the river with this hand in this spot like you're obviously bluffing um but you know the w- the way that i got here and perhaps like the frequency that i was going to get here with this hand was maybe out of line um I'm just like seem that crazy cer- to me. Certainly huh? not supposed to five bet a lot. Um, <laughs> and and Doug later told me what I found interesting about the whole thing um, is that Doug later told me that he was playing a strategy that never five bets other than going all in. So like regardless of stack depth, regardless of how deep we got, he was never going to five bet like to the sizing that I chose with any hand. This doesn't matter. Like in my opinion, this is like kind of trivial. Like the decision whether or not you should do it. Whether you should five bet all in or five bet small. Like this is something that's not worth paying attention to. Well, I, yeah, so I agree, but I guess like the implications of that. So I I haven't, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably talk to him about this at some point, but the implications of that might change the way that his four betting strategy looks depending on whether he was like studying a solution that, that played his five betting strategy or was studying a solution that played my five betting strategy. Um, so it was, you know, I'd kind of, it was hard for me, uh, going into the match to like know what to expect of his, of his preflop ranges. Um, and I think that was like something that I misinterpreted, like how he was going to approach four betting. I definitely thought his four betting strategy was going to look different. Um, not based on like anything substantial. I just, just kind of assumed his four betting strategy would would look a little different, um, and not have as many hands like what he had, like ace jack ace jack suited. I mean, totally reasonable four bet, but he had queen jack suited in a different hand, um, which was also kind of interesting. Looks like he's changed his preflop strategy a bit. 
I, I think it's worth talking about why uh, we both agree on why this five bet decision does not really matter that much, because I think it's an important thing to think about for the audience. Sure. But the reason is basically, I mean, I think we're presumably both on the same page. Uh, that, uh, first of all, I don't think there's much EV difference between, like, five betting small and, like, jamming all in, especially if you have, like, somewhat reasonable ranges. And secondly, um, I mean, that's one of the, that's a big reason. Secondly, it's such an infrequent situation that, like, even if you get in it, it's not going to, yeah, I mean, if you make a big mistake, it'll cost much EV, but all you have to do is, like, play somewhat reasonably and you won't make large mistakes. Would you agree with that analysis? Yeah, I think, like, I think the infrequency matters a lot. I also think like like once you start once you start narrowing down to ranges where it where it only really makes sense to have like aces for value, then it I think it becomes quite apparent like why it doesn't matter so much. Like which as as long as you're like doing something good for pocket aces, I feel like you're making money. Like <laughs> it's pretty hard not to do. <laughs> like you just have to <laughs> like you're not gonna make money at least in theory. And, and maybe I thought that I could, but, you know, who knows? Um, in theory, you're not going to make money five betting king four suited. You're just, like, doing it because you have to, because you want to five bet aces, right? Like, there's no, there's no, like, secret path to making money with other hands. You're just, like, doing what you need to do to make sure your aces get paid when you have aces. Um, well, that's the GTO way of thinking, yes. Yeah. Sometimes they get a little king four suited in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, uh, well... I don't want to go too much into this rabbit hole, to be honest. Just I think it's important to for players to um, – it becomes increasingly important for players to not get caught up in, like, useless rabbit holes, speaking of which, um, when they're, like, looking at their game because, uh, you know, the complexity of situations can get more and more complex and it just becomes, like, less and less worth it depending on, you know, like, what you're trying to actually accomplish, which is, like, winning money in this case, right? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, that's, I mean, just on the topic of poker coaching, because I know you're a poker coach, I would think things like that become like this, like approach from a different angle of what to look for when, you know, trying to help people get better is like, don't waste energy in like stupid situations, like trying to figure out what your five bet bluff frequency is against yeah. four bet. And um, yeah, I just think like patterns like that would be useful. Do you, uh, is, is, uh, do you find yourself explaining things a lot like that when you're coaching or how do you coach actually? Because you must, co uh, yeah. even then, like what kind of players do you coach? Yeah. So I think, well, I guess like to, to start with what kind of players, like the, the typical person who I'm working with is, you know, like a reasonably successful pro or like an emerging pro, um, who has hit some kind of ceiling, uh, some kind of like independent learning ceiling. And generally speaking, I think that, you know, I have, I have like good insights or at least better than the average professional to, to know like, you know, what's the, what's like the functional difference between what a top player is doing and like what you, you know, the, the kind of average grinder is doing. Um, and occasionally I work with other people. Occasionally I work with just like recreationals who are super interested um, in high level poker. Uh, but that's only been kind of a recent phenomenon since I started playing on like more televised tables and more more final tables and stuff like that but I think you know what ends up happening a lot when I'm working with you know grinders or or like reasonably successful pros is I'm like evaluating their process and and trying to help them figure out like not only what are you not good at but where do you need to spend your time like working on your game to make the biggest game to make the biggest improvements right like kind of what you're suggesting which i fully agree with is that like a lot of people waste their time on on minutia and like exciting things and interesting little quirks in the game that that can like really eat up your attention um and they just look over like massive sources of ev um or they have blind spots for massive sources of ev so like in my mind the the role of a coach is just to you know to open their eyes a little bit um and, and direct their attention to the right places uh that makes a lot of sense um that's what i would think and uh can you tell us some of the things that oh and by the way before i go on i'd like to mention that you actually referred uh i was actually talking to, to a friend about like how coaching rates were often 
Um, like a, a very good coach, PLO coach, at, at Dylan Wiseman, who I personally got coaching from, actually. Uh, I was very impressed. And he, he, I was telling him, like, oh, there's a lot of, like, no-limit coaches that, uh, you know, they charge, like, exorbitant fees just because they should and it shouldn't be this way. And then he was like, but Kevin Rabinchow, no, this is, like, a really good, like, no-limit player. This guy's, like, top of his game, like, a legit coach. Uh, you should, no, he's, like, he's like the exception to that rule. So I was thinking, Oh shit, this guy must be like really <laughs> legit. Um, and, uh, so props for that because most people don't get that, that compliment. And there's a lot of like bad coaches, I think, and know that they don't necessarily win. Um, so what are the, some of the, um, the things that many of these emerging poker players don't do that many top players do that, uh, th- make them the top players. Yeah. Um, well, I guess first, thanks for, for the kind words, and I suppose also thanks to, to Dylan, if that's when that conversation happened. But um, I think, like, I mean, I, I guess there's, like, two categories um, of, of differences. There's, there's like, the strategic um, differences, just, like, in, in basic execution, where I think, like, a lot of top players are... They just care about every spot like they care about every pot they fight for every pot they understand what needs to be done in every situation they're playing to like play tough in that spot if, if you know what i mean like just sure yes i do the for for lack of a better way of describing it they just like take every hand they're in quite seriously and they and they try to compete in every hand and and i think a lot of grinders just don't like i think a lot of grinders honestly maybe they've they've just like decided it's okay to pass on spots or they've decided that it's like not important to fight for certain scenarios because they think like, oh, well, that player has the stronger range there. Whatever explanation they come up with, like, oh, that player has the stronger range there, so I don't need to, you know, to defend properly. And I think with like, you know, you pile up little mentalities like that and all of a sudden you're just, you know, a nit who who doesn't fight for any hands and you kind of get run over in tougher games. Um, but that style works when you're in soft games, so it doesn't doesn't like get brought to their attention until until they challenge themselves, right? Like until they play in games where they're getting they're getting exploited. Um, so I think that's like the major strategic difference that a lot of people uh, struggle with. And then and then there's more like the I don't know, like the preparation, you know, and and the execution, like the the lifestyle, just like the whole the the more holistic side of like what a top player cares about and and what like a a grinder cares about. And I. I think to some extent, like I, I, I work with a lot of players who I think have only really looked at the game from one angle. Like a lot of them maybe just learned it by like, they they came up in the PO solver era and they just like studied Sims all day and they got really, really good at the Sims. And like, that's it, you know, like, I, and, and we both know that poker is like a lot more complicated than just like, what's the solution in this spot. Um, but that's also because we learned the game at a time where like solutions weren't there. So you kind of had to like learn all the different skills, like all the soft skills of poker, the psychology of poker. Like it's, it's actually pretty, it's pretty insightful to me. Some of the conversations I have with my students these days, like younger students who weren't around in like the field player era. And they just have like no idea about the psychology of poker. Like it's just like, they don't, they don't know what metagame is. Like they don't know what other players are thinking about. They just like only know the sim and that's, it's like kind of yeah. mind blowing for me, but it's it's actually like really valuable insights that I get when I coach these players, um, and it reminds me like why coming up before solvers was so was so valuable. Well, yeah, I could see that if someone's not playing perfect GTO, but like it's super hard to play perfect GTO. To be fair, I mean, yeah. in my experience, people are not playing anywhere near perfect GTO. Yeah, I see it. Like I see some stuff that's like, okay, this guy's hit. This guy's been. In his in the basement, looking at some Sims, all lights dimmed. Yeah. Uh, they got the computer blazing. It's turning into a good uh, Android or whatever. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's not that frequent, to be honest. I mean, I see it more at, like high level MTTs and stuff like this, and like cash games from like specific people where they like really get that EV out and really like uh, try to go for all the. The spots that the sims go and even at the top level mtts to be honest i don't see a lot of the advanced stuff going on too much um well i think like i mean an, an example that comes to mind of a of a scenario that like 
a solver, you know, a, a, a sim only type player would struggle in is just like put him in a put him in a six max game where the recreational player is on their left and you know a, a loose aggressive pro opens the cutoff like how mm. should they play in the small blind like they just don't know like they just they know how to play cutoff for small blind but like they've never had to think about like okay well how do i make the most money when the recreational is on my left or like how do i make the most money post flop when you know i'm i'm in a I'm in a heads up pot against someone who like generally plays too passive or generally plays too this way or too that way. Like they've, Mm -hmm. that's what I feel like heads up no limit prepared me for really well. It's just like learning all the different responses to all the different things that get thrown your way. Um, And you just like, you could just study Sims for like five years and never learn any of that stuff. Um, So you just like have to win the minimum in, in every environment that you play instead of like actually knowing how to win the max. I think um, there's, uh, on the topic, yeah, that makes a ton of sense, uh, first of all. I think on the topic of, like, different angles and stuff, and even with the topic of Sims, one thing I kind of realized was there's sort of a diminishing return to for every um, kind of rabbit hole that you go down under. Like, you could end up being, like, you could study the shit out of the Sims and be, like, the best Sims person in the world. Um, but if, like, one, you never actually... If, if your simulations are, like, quite limited in their scope and you only look at ba- basic sizes, it's not that useful. And two, like, y- you'd have to, like, exp- be a bit more explorative with the sims and look at, like, some alternative possibilities and things like that. Um, even then, there's, like, some really compelling insights uh, with, you know, alternative strategies you can use that have a similar EV to sims. I mean, we even looked at a couple ourselves. Uh, and then there's, like, uh, you know, with things like such as exp- uh, overbetting, et cetera, like there's really like some spots you miss if you don't factor in other certain bet sizes, um, and on top of that, even in the the realm of like looking into the Sims, as you're saying, like once you get the concept of what's going on, I think, yeah, you'll make some mistakes if you're not perfect, but you can't be perfect, and it's really important to, you know, start looking at these other factors that matter more when you're actually dealing with real people. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um. I think a big mistake that a lot of people make when it comes to actually making money is they focus so much on like what their actual game looks like and not so much how their optionality for games looks like and where the money is actually at. Um, do you, uh, do you explore this route that much you're like with your students? Do you know what I mean? Uh, I guess, do you, are you referring to like literal game selection or? Well, even more than game selection, it's like, yeah, game selection is one element of that. It's like a sub, uh, it's like a, it's like a subcategory of that. But, but above that would be like, well, you could go into live games. You could go into different websites where there's games on them. Mm -hmm. Um, You want to know all the different websites that you want to play on, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Especially if you're at lower stakes, there's a bit more options and you can like really clean up at lower stakes for a while it gets more big it's trickier at higher stakes this is what i personally learned yeah uh, and i had to like learn other games i had to learn like mixed games and then short deck and then uh, you switched to tournaments right i mean uh, was there did you go to tournaments for this kind of reason or what because i know that heads up was like tough for yeah. a really while for i mean my switch my switch was honestly like more about what game i was enjoying and and what was more motivating for me to spend time on because yeah it was just like i was a little bit disillusioned about cash games um the whole cash game environment was like well you know like kind of some of the stuff you're talking about i got good at because of the cash game environment because i had to like constantly change sites and constantly change um you know between live and online and and different different formats buy a bunch of ipads then stop using those iPads, then download a bunch of emulators, you know, like just kind of changing game environments frequently was part of the, the ecosystem. Um, but I didn't really enjoy that. I, I kind of, uh, I was really drawn to the simplicity of like showing up to a venue, registering, you know, buying my ticket, sitting down at the scheduled time, leaving at the scheduled time, like kind of, it's, it's, I don't know, something about the routine of it, um, was was relieving uh as opposed to like my cash game experience which was you know a lot of like early mornings and late nights and feeling like you can never leave and 
things like that. So it, it was more of a lifestyle thing for me. Um, and I definitely find myself talking with a lot of, a lot of my students who play live poker, I definitely talked to them about this stuff. Um, I, I mean, even just friends of mine are like way more uh, in tune, I think, with like all the different options that they could be exploring and the different kind of career paths within poker. Um, but most often, like, I don't know, there's so many factors there. It's, it's hard for me to like prescribe the right thing for a student. Um, because, you know, it depends, like, are they trying to make the most money in the short term? Are they trying to like move into some other game that, that is their real goal? Are they, you know, are they stuck in a certain location? Do they have the freedom to travel? Like there's, there's so many complicated variables there. Um, it's definitely like a good, a good topic to talk about though. Uh, okay, well, uh, if you found some kind of ways of like solving these problems that's uh, systematic, that'd be really interesting. If you if you did not explore that route much at all, um, I I'm curious what you found so enjoyable about the was it mostly online MTTs or it sounded like it was live tournaments quite a lot. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I got into tournaments as like through the live format. Um, it was actually playing. In 2019 was the first uh, Poker Stars PSPC in the Bahamas. And I went to that and thought it was like an amazing event. And then there were some other promotions that year where I was able to play like some live 10Ks. I think like the Party Poker live events were doing a promotion. So I like traveled a bit and played these live events. Got lucky in one of them, like made some money that year and just, just like really enjoyed the live MTT um, opportunities. And then when COVID hit, I moved online with everyone else and like played a solid two years of online tournaments. But it was, it was kind of with the mindset, like I want to compete in big live tournaments and in order to get better, I should be playing these online tournaments. Like it was, it, I kind of knew it was a short term commitment, um, but more like an investment in my tournament game. And I think it was successful. I like made a little bit of money and got a lot better technically um and and now i hardly play online tournaments anymore now it's now it's just like the live tournaments again oh, oh really okay okay um uh but uh what uh what were there any other factors in in live tournaments that made you really like them i mean just like i mean it's it's funny because i never would have said this 10 years ago but like it's it's just a lot more fun than playing online like it's i just like like I like going to the series. I like talking to people. Um, I find playing live more engaging as well. Like I'm really interested in behavior and psychology and I'm, I'm really interested in like, I don't know the, the reason people play a certain way. And I don't know, all, all that stuff really comes together when you're playing live, when you're playing online. Like I, I feel like I used to be pretty good at intuiting like someone's mental state online, but it was always, it's very abstract. Like you're kind of guessing at, you know, if someone's tilted or if someone's, you know, afraid or if whatever it is. And when you're playing live, it's just like all there, all the information is there. There's, there's just like a lot more to explore. And I think it's fun. Oh, are these even in high, high rollers too? I would think in high rollers, most people are pretty, um, or at least, uh, kind of have their game fairly straightforward. I mean, there's some exceptions yeah. for sure. Um, what's that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I play I play a mix of like the high rollers and the open field main events, and certainly the stuff I'm talking about is like way more prevalent in the open field main events. But oh yeah, yeah. I there's was about like to say. <laughs> there's, there's a good element of it in high rollers. It just it, it depends on the crowd you get. Um, right. Yeah, I would think that too. Like certain players are just not going to really change that much. Yeah. But also it's like kind of the nature of their own game is that they, they don't have that many extremes in their own game. So right. it's very easy to like not really change your game when you, your game doesn't involve many, um, many like excursions, you can say. Hmm. Yeah, like if, if, they're, if they're a fairly like routined and systematic player, like, you know, standard, standard bet sizing, um, fairly predictable i guess in their in their strategy like there's not going to be i don't know yeah like you you get the most kind of interesting stuff when like someone's being forced outside their comfort zone or someone's like oh, playing sure. outside their comfort zone so yeah mm -hmm. 
And I think tournaments bring that out too. Like, oh, for sure. Money bubbles, final tables, bigger stakes, like just dinner, like easy, like live social settings, like, like someone abrasive being at the table. I don't know, like bad tournament schedules, <laughs> dealer mistakes, you know, floor rulings, like all that stuff. It, it, it affects the game. It's, it's interesting. Um, uh, I could, uh, yeah, I would think it happens, especially at, uh, oh, I was going to say that uh, I have a personal theory that people tend to reverse, revert to their base nature once um, they're put out more and more in their comfort zone when it becomes more extreme. You can see they're more like base reactions to things. Mm. Yeah, there was, oh, this is like reminding me of an old, an old saying. It was probably off of like two plus two, but I can't remember what it was. Uh, but is it, it's something to the effect, it, it's the same idea that you're getting at, like, you know, like you can, like a knit shows their, uh, their kind of true self. Like, I, I don't know when you, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get the phrasing right. But the idea is like, when you get into those kind of uncomfortable spots, like you find out who's a knit and who's an animal, right? Like, like when you, when you get it, there's, <laughs> there's just like, yeah, there's like an emotional element to when you get into these rare certain situations, like some people just always fold and other people just like never bluff and other people always bluff. And, uh, but, it, but it takes like a certain <laughs> convergence of elements to like get to those scenarios. Like it, it has to be uncharted territory. Uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, yeah, it, it, um, I can see a lot of extremes being brought out by in the tournament situation, especially I've like, taught a lot told a lot of people selves that uh i've uh given advice to or coached like you know like it's very very hard for tr certain tournament players to really once they're deep into a tournament once the pressure's really on it's really, really hard to like do certain things and you just like never see it yeah especially when like added psychological factors are taken into account such as they lose a huge pot or they like just did something stupid or something that can really feel stupid yeah. Um, they're like highly likely to like not do it again, uh, yeah. like the next hand or the next few hands, yeah. especially if they've got like backers too, <laughs> like people they've got to answer to yep. <laughs> and all these things. <laughs> There's not too many cowboys out there. <laughs> yeah. And add, add in the stream too. Like, I mean, people, they, they find out your whole cards afterwards. Like it's, yeah. Oh, I've seen some effects from me having my hands being streamed a little bit uh it's not like super well actually for the stream game it's been very very strong um what would be some do you have any examples of times in tournaments you've played where psychology made you make a huge lay down or um a big bluff or big call or anything like that yeah i mean I guess when when I think of psych using psychology, like there's a bunch of there's a bunch of little spots that I guess I'm just taking sort of naturally because you know it's it's like a population thing. It's like okay, well, mo you know, most people most people aren't willing to float the flop here enough, you know, af after they've after facing a check raise so like i'm just gonna check it you know when that spot comes up it's like pattern recognition but i that's a little different like i i think the psychology of for example like I, I i like the idea that you um that you mentioned in the middle there of like someone having just won a big pot for example or like someone having just uh gotten caught running a big bluff um actually uh, I've used, I think most recently, the one where like there's certain players, mostly recreational, I guess, but like I think there's a certain type of player who's uh, I, I was just remembering how I categorized them when I was when I was retelling a hand um, during Barcelona, EPT Barcelona a couple weeks ago, but like like there's there's guys who they they give you these lanyards when you when you show up that have like your, um, your ID, it's like your ID badge and, um, you need it to get into the casino every day. And it says like EPT on it. And 
like all the pros just like swipe and put it in their pocket but there's like a few guys who like wear the lanyard around their neck like they're at a conference like the whole day and it just really? felt like that was to, to me that was like a clear signal like oh they're they're quite proud to be here like this is uh, you know i've never seen this person before they're here in the event like oh they're like <laughs> like this is a big deal to them right like they're literally wearing the lanyard it was almost like a tag on their on their chests like happy to be here um so then like you, you know you see a guy um like that who's like very excited about the moment um win a bunch of chips like he doesn't want to let those chips go like like when you're when you're like when the money's getting serious and the event has this like gra like gravity to it um i think someone who just won a big pot is like an easy target for for aggression um so i can think of a couple times where i like saw you know not like that exact person wearing the lanyard but like <laughs> you just see you see someone who like wins a big pot um after like a fairly long tournament day they're like they're good like in their mind like oh i've i've like hit my goal for the day you know like i've got i've got 200,000 chips in day 1 of the main event like i'm i'm set so like that person's getting three bet for the rest of the night you know like they're just <laughs> <laughs> they just are <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny you know it can go the other way too like someone could win a big pot and think okay i can like mess around now or it's important. Yeah. I, I think the profile the is a key element. Like the, the profile of like excited just to be here is kind of a, a key element. Cause there's, there's yeah, other people sure. who just certainly don't, don't care. Um, yeah, there was a, there was a guy, I think he's actually like a pro in other formats, but there was a guy who showed up to my day two table in one of the side events who just had like a mountain of chips, like six starting stacks or seven starting stacks or something. And, managed to lose it all in the first hour, like bluffing every hand, showing, like getting called, showing the bluff, and then just like running another one the very next hand. And then, you know, three betting light and then getting it in like on the flop with, you know, whatever, two over cards. Uh, and, it, you know, the, yeah, it's, it's definitely important to categorize someone as like happy to be here and like plans to stay or like, you know, ready to ready to go home kind of like I've, I've used that categorization before as well like is someone someone really hoping to make it to the end of the day or are they ready to go home like in a tournament that matters a lot because like so you know certain people really care about their tournament life and other people just do not or or they've like lost enough chips that they've just checked out and they've decided like no this tournament's over for me like i'm going home i'm i'm already done oh okay yeah, yeah, I could see that making sense. I was actually thinking when you mentioned that example, maybe there's a distinction between people who like forget to bring their lanyard or like lose it. Also, I don't know. Yeah, I could I see that. <laughs> the people, the people who like check in, the people who check into the table with no ID, and it's just like, oh yeah, just just tell the floor like he knows me. Like those, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're not the targets uh, to three bet. You don't you don't three bet those guys. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I was trying to think. I haven't played too many 10Ks. I remember that specifically in these main event things, it felt like, at least in the beginning, people were pretty trigger happy, and I just got picked off like never before mm. in these 10Ks. Actually, those are the spots where I get picked off the most, mm. is when um, I was playing like some the main event, like some... The main event, like, especially in the WSOP or whatever, like, someone will call me in some spot. But, like, normally I get countless folds, and I'll just be like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it seems like my typical exploits don't don't always work um, for whatever reason in these, the 10 case. But I could see that, the j that just, like, not mattering nearly as much, like, later into the tournament. Or maybe I just need to find the guys with the lanyards to bluff. So there's like they're, there's they're here to yeah there's definitely like I mean there's definitely an element of the tournament going through these different stages where like there's there's certain times and certain days where people are very willing to gamble and there's other times where it's just like they they cannot bust and it's not just like money bubble versus you know early in the in the tournament I think it's like last few hands of the night versus 
you know, the very, the very start or like the very, very first hand or the very first hand after a break, like there's a very different mentality around those kind of hands compared to like the fifth hour of day one. We haven't yet taken dinner break. They haven't gotten anything going. Like that's, that's like not a great time to bluff someone. <laughs> I feel like, like they're, they're kind of ready to, to go home then. But like last three hands of the day or like, um, yeah, I don't know. For some, for some reason, if, I mean, this isn't like scientific at all, but I feel like the very first hand after coming back from a break, like no one, wa no one's ready to fight yet. Like maybe on hand three, but like hand one, like you just sat down, you can't get right back up, you know? Okay. If that's that one, that one might seems be seems ridiculous, but okay. <laughs> that one might be, uh, that one it's, it's certainly unsubstantiated, but it's been my experience. So I've heard, um, well, I, I want to ask, do you have any plans to play any other kinds of tournaments? Are you going to play like the PLO tournaments as well? Or uh, are there any other kinds of poker? Or you, are your plans to just uh, continue um, coaching and uh, play tournaments? Or what is it? I think for now the plan is to continue with coaching and, and no limit tournaments. Um, I have like a bit of a, a break for the next couple of months, uh, break from playing anyways, other than uh, probably some online, uh, like the end of the WSOP online and the and the WCOOP main event are coming up in like two weeks. And there's a there's a 10K heads up event as well. So when they when they run heads up events online, I, I certainly try to play those. But the yeah, the plan is to stick with like the occasional no limit tournament series. And then when I'm home, I do a lot of coaching work and do my prep and then go out on the trips and, and keep playing the no limit tournaments. There's honestly just, there's so many big no limit tournament series right now that it's, it's hard for me to like imagine taking on a new game. Um, but certainly it's, it's quite interesting that like PLO and mixed games are starting to get more, uh, space on the schedules uh i think that's like if i was going to learn a new format in the next year that would be like a top priority for me uh just because i feel like there's you know there's a lot of opportunity there the overlap between like a like a historically cash game form you know like most of these guys play cash games or the tournament players just like never really play those formats so i i think like all the all the elements we've been talking about um, would be amplified in like a like a mixed game tournament. Suppose as the as the reigning PPC champ, you would you would have some some insight into that. Um, I think I need to play a few more to see for sure. Uh, I would say that in my experience, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. You definitely want to like uh, profile your opponents a bit because some will be the type to get very creative even though they don't know the games and some will totally just like overfold because they don't know the games as well i mean it's gotten both types quite yeah. a lot uh and that would be really the way to look at it i i think usually uh people i mean the bottom line really is that people just end up being on some side of a line that's ridiculous you know without like more experience i mean i don't really um I don't think it's really good overall to like just kind of roll over when you don't know the game too well. Maybe like a little bit, but not that much. People get really crazy with uh, giving up equity in the games that they don't know. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's like quite a big mistake in my opinion. If they if they do that, and for one, they don't, um, you know, they pass up quite a lot of EV, and secondly, they don't like actually learn by. If the the only way you really learn is like getting in there and getting out there. Yeah. Well, that's a major factor. Any major, like, uh, catalyst for it is getting in some spots, basically. Yeah. So you, the more spots you get into, the more you learn. Um, but, yeah, there's some mixed games tournaments. Like, the Badoogie one I heard was, like, super good. Badoogie is actu actually one of the few limit games where there is a massive edge, to be fair. Hmm. So these other ones, um, people are a little bit kidding themselves with, like, Stud 8 and, and Limit 08. I mean, sometimes there's dead money, but... Like, I don't know, it's just really easy to fix those kinds of mistakes. Um, I want to ask, uh, 
do you, do you have any like goals in mind for tournaments and for coaching? I know you won a almost five hundred thousand dollars. Maybe that's changed since I had checked, but five hundred thousand dollars from a like a live cash as well. Maybe you've got some more goals in mind. Yeah, I mean, I still have yet to win a major title live. Um, I've had three second places in relatively major events that's a little um, annoying it is especially as a heads-up specialist i've i've gotten a lot of it. a lot of needles about the three second places um <laughs> i don't know why they want to needle you but okay <laughs> so i think that's uh that's that's priority number one for tournament play um i mean i'm just going to keep showing up to the same sorts of events uh mostly in the u.s and expect to just win one and for coaching um coaching has been interesting i mean i have i have some ambitious goals for like different formats of coaching i've been doing a lot more like project-based stuff recently and and collaborating with other coaches and, and taking on like more ambitious clients which i think is really exciting and i think that i see like more um not like more opportunity but I'm just a little more excited about the stuff that I could do in coaching um, in the coming years because it's different. Whereas like tournaments, it's, you know, I want to show up to the same tournaments and I want to win one. That's great. Um, but I'm taking on like, you know, more, more ambitious clients, working in more competitive atmospheres, um, just like trying to accomplish more as a coach uh, with the types of projects that I'm taking on. And I think that's... Uh, that's that's going to get more of my attention uh, for the next couple of years. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if you find some ambitious uh, clients, then um, maybe this, you know, if you have a part of their upside, then in theory, if you can help them, that would be great. Uh, I want to ask, actually, do you often run into various emotional barriers? when dealing with clients, like, do they have these various emotional problems such as tilt or they're on, they're unwilling to run various bluffs or what else? Uh, they're afraid to move up in stakes or, um, they just like can't hero call like things along these lines. Do you run into various barriers like that? And do you have many methods for overcoming them? So I don't, I don't have a ton of experience with this. I think for a lot of my clients in the past, those types of concerns have been like hidden from me because the the like the interaction online for a lot of like coach student relationships is sort of like the student brings what they need addressed and then the coach like helps them address it and that's just kind of that and like there's not a whole lot of opportunities i guess for me as the coach to like identify these uh these more like in-game detriments like the kinds of problems that happen when we're not on a call together um so it's really only like the 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 more like emotionally intelligent and the more forthcoming students who like bring that stuff to me and it's like hey like this you know this happened in this big spot and like i'm really mm -hmm. you know it really bothers me and i don't have a solution for it and a lot of times in the past i've um kind of uh, referred them out to other coaches who like specialize in performance or in mental game or stuff like that. But I've tried to spend more time in the last year or two, like just researching those fields myself and also receiving coaching in those fields so that I can be better at addressing those things myself. So I'm like, you know, let's, let's call it like intermediate in my ability to help people work through things like, like tilt or fear. Um, a big, big help has been Jason Sue. If you're not familiar with him, he wrote Poker with Presence, and he he does really? a lot of uh, he does a lot of really good work. I think. No, um, I'm not familiar with him. Uh, I was thinking actually it might be your friend that you introduced introduce me with, introduced yeah. me to. But does he also do this kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, his, name. his his style his style of coaching performance. Uh, Jared Alderman's who you're referring to. Jared, Jared's style is is most similar, I would say, in the industry to Jason. Um, they're the only two people I am aware of in poker who take that sort of, like, I don't know, 
it's it's a less performance focused approach to mental game i i think there's a lot of like great coaches who are very like here's your problem in performance here's the methods we're going to use to fix those things um and i think that's like specialized and, and requires a lot of training and it's not something that i'm super familiar with um, oh okay so there are people who are too specialized in this kind of stuff yeah i think like i mean elliot Rowe comes to mind as someone who you know tra like trained in hypnotherapy and and very specifically addresses these kinds of you know uh like mental processes and, and how they develop and you know really have to go through like serious work to to address like the the origin of those of those like emotional um distressors distresses uh but in in the work that i did i mean it's I, I, at least personally it just like isn't really something that i struggle with i struggle with more like off table stuff and i struggle with i don't know just um yeah like less less acute mental game challenges more more like broad mental game challenges um and that was something that jason helped me with and and jared i think is very good at working through those things as well uh okay. more like more like mindfulness and um they're they're both big on, on being content being content with with who you are and kind of like accepting the reality of of you know your situation or your life and that mm -hmm. takes that takes work as well that's that's not an sure. easy thing yeah 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 i i'll say that i took some hypnotherapy a bit for a couple emotionally distressing problems one took i'm getting over uh this one emotionally traumatic experience with a girl that took years uh but uh, there's a lot of just like yeah that one was very complicated i would say um and then one with um uh with sweets and just trying not to get to sugar by sweets i've tried some stuff with that um but uh it's, it was one of the more interesting routes to take there's a few different like methodologies for this kind of stuff uh i'm really curious to check out some other stuff i think um i know that yoga essentially does variations of this and meditation et cetera, et cetera. um it does help with like the overall contentment and that kind of stuff and like uh, i guess yoga helps with pushing boundaries and things like this um i mean i could see like i mean i could hypothetically see other possibilities of things doing this as well like working out and actually maybe cooking maybe cooking does something i know you're a bit of a cook a chef yeah uh is that right what what is it yeah. that uh made you decide to get into cooking do you find it helps you with stuff I, I find it stuff. i find it really helpful i think it's i think it's pretty therapeutic um i mean i like as as someone as someone like who never had to do hard labor and is and is quite privileged um i i found it humorously rewarding to actually like do things with my own hands like create things um and it's even better that it's food and i love food um so it's it, it was like a I, w I went to culinary school it was it was sort of a a hobby that turned into a a very intense like two years of of barely playing poker and kind of half half quitting my career so that i can just like work in the kitchen um but i, I found my way back eventually through through live tournaments um but yeah it was just like it's just like an interest of mine that i gave a lot of space and uh super happy that i did because I, I think it's great made me a much better home cook um but that's that's i think all that i'll be doing for the foreseeable future is just home cooking all right well maybe we can have a little cook off you must have more, more experience than me i know some some cooking things but i like i don't know i'm not so into it i would think uh it'd be more relaxing thing or i don't know i feel like there's something in cooking that that is special but i don't 100% know what it is except for adding a spice and making sure you give the best dish to your opponents. <laughs> I know that's, that's in there too. Yeah. Um, we do have to go in a, a second. Uh, is any, is there anything you would like to say more about your chefdom or future aspirations or anything else or your, uh, um, any, any, you, if you'd like to promote your coaching program as well, I'm happy to do that. Uh, sure. Yeah. whatever you'd like to talk about for the last few minutes yeah i mean um i mean certainly we've we've touched on a lot of interesting topics i i don't think i have any more uh culinary 
adventures to share, at least not today, but... Well, you um, should if you have some. No, I, th I, th I mean, <laughs> it's, I don't know how seriously you're suggesting a cook-off. Uh, I've actually been trying to work that out with... I, uh, there's been a couple of people in poker. It seems to seems to really connect with people, the idea of, like, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's just because we all, like, order takeout three times a day, so so we uh, we think that home cooking is, like, a, the real pinnacle of achievement, but it's, uh, <laughs> I, I do think it's a, I do think it's a super nice skill, um, but it, you know, it's, it's similar, I guess, to, like, a lot of uh, slow hobbies, you might call them, right, like, I don't know, the equivalent of, like, knitting or pottery or something like this, like just making stuff with your hands and doing something that takes a long time and is actually kind of boring. Well, um, we, could, uh, well, we can maybe orchestrate a cook-off between me, you, and Hecklin. Oh, he yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah that'd I'm be probably good. that underdog, but I'll find a way. That'd be good. Um, I heard I heard recently that he is an, an, an extremely good chef. And, oh, uh, shit. I, I, oh. <laughs> I, miss, I miss the opportunity. Um, to try some of his cooking, but apparently he makes a mean steak, which is right. not necessarily yeah. my specialty, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. My cooking will be a troll, and you guys can like taste it and be like, ah, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's what you get for beating me. Um, but anyway, what's your, uh, what's your coaching program called? Uh, we got to get out of here in a second. Sure. Yeah, um, pretty much all the information about my coaching is at my website, which is just my full name, .com, kevinrabichow.com. Um, I do a lot of like, uh, mentorship style programs. Uh, it's long, longer term commitments. I like to work with people for at least a few months and, and get to know them and try to diagnose like how to spend our time and all of those sorts of things. So for, for the serious, um, poker player, I think it's, it's the best format. Uh, and I also did a bunch of work with run at once, um, that you've, that you mentioned at the beginning, I have a course on there. Um, and I still put out regular videos for elite subscribers. So if you want to just see some of my content, uh, it's over at runatonce.com. All right, cool, cool. Uh, yeah, and guys, you should check out both of those places for sure. If you're, it certainly is coaching stuff if you're very serious about learning. Anything, any last words, Kevin? Plans for the future? Anything else? We got to go. Uh, no, I think we covered it. Uh, this has been really fun. Thank you. All right. Yes, so thank you for your time, Kevin, uh, and best of luck in the tournament series. And I might just, uh, might just <laughs> with your psychology. Uh, I look forward to it. Yeah. All right. Great.